Sure. Thank you. Now, thanks all the other participants. That was uh, very educational for me. You know, I kind of know all these folks if in a, or a roundabout way, but, uh, you know, I learned so much more tonight. So it's great to hear from all of you. Um, and I guess from the fisherman's perspective, what I would add is, you know, it's a great thing you're working on to protect these smaller boats. You know, as you've heard, um, as you've heard, you know, our industry has evolved as a ground fish industry. You know, when I first got my first boat, there was 2,700 active ground fishermen in the tri-state area, Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Right now, there's about 80 boats left. And they're, you know, the small boat fleet is extinct for uh, all practical purposes, right? It's just the way the cookie crumbled. Um, and there's, you know, so protecting these smaller boats, like you guys, uh, I think you got a great idea to try and figure out how to keep these little guys going and diversifying like, like uh, they have. You know, my story is, you know, like all the others here, we've had to figure out ways to continue to stay in business in the fishing industry in some form or another because of those regulatory changes, um, you know, that none of us could kind of predict. We all had to learn how to adapt and overcome and, and change the way we think about things uh, as individuals. And it was great to hear the other stories. You know, as a fisherman for myself, um, you know, and, and I've done commercial fishing from Maine to Key West, Florida, and, you know, my predominant fishery was always gill netting and long lining bottom fishing, uh, bought ground fish in New England, and, um, you know, tuna was always a part of it. And then for me now, I guess my little life ring, if you will, uh, to survive the regulatory process was this idea of Wicked Tuna. When they came along, I never imagined it growing into what it is today. Uh, but I was thinking, well, I still have my boat. We always did a few charters. You know, charters carrying passengers for hire was one of the things we did early on to try and, um, you know, do something with the boat when, you know, like some of the regulatory things that went into place closed certain areas to commercial fishing, but you know, under the recreational rules, you were allowed to fish in there for certain months. So, you know, doing charters was a way to keep the boat busy. And uh, so I saw that opportunity with the TV thing, you know, again, never expecting it to grow as much as it has, but as a charter boat operator, I was, well, it's a great opportunity to promote my charter business, right? I mean, what an opportunity uh, it was. And that's been the biggest uh, plus to come from all of that. You know, we that's how we went from, you know, we had one boat, now we have two boats. And, the, you know, my, my son runs the hard merchandise. I run the Falcon. We have a thriving far higher uh, fishery for both our uh, bottom fish in New England, Attic, Cod, Pollock, and of course, tuner is a big part of what we do, both for hire and in the commercial sale. And, um, you know, one of the, I guess, the positives that came out of the pandemic was this notion of distributing these tuner in particular now that we catch to the local community. Um, you know, I, I always watched uh, Vito, he, his facility is right adjacent to where I tie up. And, you know, they were on the ball when, when this all started. Um, you know, I always was impressed the way, you know, they got out there first with their curbside service and, and things like that. And, you know, I was just sitting back watching all that unfold myself going, he's on to something there. That's a way, that's a way forward. I could see that. So it was always great. And, you know, that way I would, I would support him when I could on social media and all that, because that's a way of the world too, these days, whether you, whether you like it or not, 
social media is part of the business model. I mean, it's free advertising. If you think about it like that, with, you know, middle of amount of effort, you can get your product and your company's product in view of a lot of people. And especially, I think it's valuable if your target is the local, the local community, because let's face it through that social media networking, you know, a big part of it winds up being people who are going to access your local product, right? So that's a great part of the formula to be adding in. You know, these are the people who are going to drive into your little fish market or where your, your farmer's market to access these products. So social media uh, has definitely should be a big part of it. I think that's a great thing. Um, you know, that being said, how do we go forward as fishermen? And I think, you know, hearing the other buyers, the way, you know, the, the other the other folks in the in the industry, uh, you know, they get it too, right? We, we, this, I think a big part of what we all have to do is expanding this domestic market. And then um, Bob brought up, you know, the bluefin tuna. Now that's a great one. And, and this is just my opinion, Bob, but, you know, cause I get a lot of flack sometimes when people say, oh, you're, you're, you're on TV catching an endangered species. And I think what they do is they intentionally confuse Pacific bluefin tuna, which is in a, you know, completely different situation as our Atlantic giant bluefin tuna. And I think those, you know, that, that don't like what we all do in the business we're all in, you know, exploit that um, greatly when it comes to, you know, that, that bluefin tuna stock, because uh, the bluefin tuna stock, at least as far as the numbers are concerned for that Pacific bluefin, you know, it's completely different than our status of the stock for our Atlantic bluefin. Now as a fisherman, and I talk with the fishermen on the West Coast, and, you know, they're seeing more of those bluefins than they have seen in literally 40 or 50 years. So we could have a debate on whether that science is a pro, but that's a fisherman's job is to, I guess, always argue about the science. But, you know, that being said, too, in spite of the difficulties and the challenges with the federal regulatory process and how frustrating at times as a fisherman or any other part of the business it can be, you know, ultimately, I think we all support the idea of a healthy ecosystem out there. Um, but again, when you, when you add in the federal government is the one in charge of leading this parade and there's at times again from a fisherman's perspective and i'm sure the buyers as well have their own host of challenges with dealing with the federal regulatory process uh, you know again it, it, i fully support it but it, I, I'll, I'll admit freely it it can be frustrating and aggravating at times but uh, you know overall We've been very blessed to, at least speaking for myself, uh, you know, the opportunities that I've had. My only regrets with any of it is, you know, I wish I could bring, there's so many other fishermen in, in, in Gloucester that could have used the same opportunity I have and, you know, and deserve it every bit as much as I do. And I just wish I could bring more of those guys along for the ride when it comes to the opportunities that I've had. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. You know, I've had an opportunity and I'm simply trying to do the best I can with that opportunity, you know, for our family. And, you know, and that's why too, I try to be supportive of the fishing industry in general because at least now, you know, I do have a voice that is somewhat amplified, you know, and like I wish I had this, I wish I had this opportunity back 10 or 15 years ago when having public support for what we try to do as fishermen when it comes to working with the federal government, you know, it would have been great to, you know, if we needed letters from the public to send 
to the powers that be that are managing fisheries. You know, if I asked my fan base now to send some letters, you know, we, we could get some letters written, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, I've been, again, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I'm very fortunate. I'm not special. I just had an opportunity. So I'm, I'm working to uh, do the best I can. And I'm, that's why I'm always happy to support, you know, businesses like Vito's or Ann's uh, or, or Bob, you know, in any way I can, because I feel obligated, you know, given my history with the fishing industry, I'm happy to support, um, you know, the guys that are left. I think that's important. And that's why when you asked if I would participate in this, when you explained what you were trying to do down there, of course, I uh, fully support all, all of that. And, you know, I definitely hope someday I get down there to meet, you know, all the fishermen on the island. And, you know, that's been one of the benefits to me, um, you know, that's come out of the show, kind of. I've had opportunities. Uh, you know, I've gone on fishing trips and met fish, you know, on fisheries that I never even imagined myself doing. And that's all stemmed out of that popularity for the show you know we so you know i've been to australia fishing those um southern bluefin on the west coast fishing the pacific bluefin and um uh, you know in italy i've been invited to italy and we've gone to italy twice now fishing those mediterranean bluefin so those are all opportunities that we're very fortunate to be able to participate in and that's all stemmed from my opportunity from the show Dave, thanks. Those are really important points. And I know um, you're vastly understating your influence as far as uh, changing some perceptions. Uh, for the most part, you have the good ones of, of our New England bluefin commercial fishery and charter fishery, but uh, you're very good. I, you made a really important point about social media, which is um, a potential really um, interesting and feasible way for Kauai fishermen to get out more fish until the infrastructure is here um, at the community, say in commercial kitchen or community kitchen. Our biggest challenge here is among many is that many of our small boat fishermen don't have a place to process. But one thing you, you mentioned too, uh, social media and branding. And let's face it, you are a big brand, but um, what are your thoughts about um, the importance of branding and American, say American caught fresh local, besides social media, do you think branding is an opportunity for, for, for example, particularly for not just residents, but um, uh, visitors that want to bring back something, say a lobster from New England or from Kauai, maybe it's going to be a piece of, you know, a vacuum pack, fresh fish or smoke. What do you have some thoughts on that? Oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you will see me doing a little more uh, when it comes to branding, especially local um, Gloucester seafood and U.S. seafood in general. You know, we have some things in the work that we'll be announcing later on this summer. And that's all built around, you know, the idea of U.S. fishermen and, and of course, Gloucester fishermen will be a big part of that as well. Because again, I think that can stand out uniquely as a brand, as a region from Gloucester. And then again, supporting any US fisheries, I think is a good bet. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that's huge. And it's one of the best opportunities we have going forward is educating the consumer to the benefits of local sustainable harvest, whether it's the tuna they see as catch, um, you know, on the haddock or, or, you know, the boats that uh, fish out of Gloucester on a regular basis, whether it be scallops or lobster, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to let the public know what it's about. And the public in general, is very blind to where their seafood come from, right? Here's one of the most the most common things, and I get this from around the world now, the show is on 
in 151 countries in 48 different languages. I get, you know, through my public email, I get fan letters from families in Pakistan, right? So they don't even have water there, but they, they're aware of the Gloucester fishery now. But one thing people, you know, and this is was eye-opening for me, I see it so frequently. When people hear the word tuna, right? Because of all the, uh, you know, the, the, let's call it the anti-fishing lobby or presence, or, you know, there's that contingent out there. Um, but when people hear that word tuna, right away in their head pops a vision of factory trawlers and dead dolphins, right? People never knew we harvested tuna like you see us do on the show. You know, the vast majority of people, again, because their campaigns, their marketing campaigns for that anti-fishing lobby have been so effective, people don't even imagine we catch fish in a sustainable way, right? So that's the big, if you will, about what we're all talking about is the big nut we have to crack is that public message, right? John Q. Public, educating the public into what small sustainable fisheries are about. Because again, in, in those, those organizations that push that, old mantra of how things may have used to be or things are in other countries but not necessarily here right uh, that hurts us that hurts us especially you know with the yeah tuna fishery as bob mentioned with you know some of the people he works with they have great concerns because obviously if they know the general public's perception is x Okay, if I see tuna on the menu, for somehow I'm supporting dead dolphins, right? We have to break that link. That's what we have to do as fishers.